Naswetha Akroiso, Aboroda Akroiso. Good evening and welcome, everyone, and good morning and welcome to those who may be attending from New Zealand. So, on behalf of uh, Wales Gene Park and Cardiff University, it's my enormous pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Matthew Cobb to you, to the, to you this evening. Uh, Matthew is a British zoologist and professor of zoology at the University of Manchester. He's a psychologist by training with a particular interest in animal behavior. He has written a number of popular science books, including The Egg and Sperm Race, The 17th Century Scientist Who Unraveled the Secrets of Sex, Life and Growth, Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code, and The Idea of the Brain, A History. Each of these books has won or been shortlisted for prizes. He's a regular on BBC Radio 4's The Infinite Monkey Cage, The Curious Cases of Rutherford and Fry, and Inside Science. If that wasn't enough to keep anyone fully occupied, Matthew has translated five books from French into English and written two books on the history of France during the Second World War. As a further measure of his outstanding ability to communicate topical subjects in genetics research, Professor Cobb is this year's recipient of the JBS Haldane Award from the Genetics Society. Matthew, uh, welcome, and it's a great pleasure to be able to host you this evening. Thank you very much, James. I'm sorry I can't speak Welsh. Uh, it's one of the things I've got to, got to learn to do, but hello everybody, and people in New Zealand, fantastic. Okay, so I'm now going to share my screen, and it all, oops, uh, it all should work. I mean, I spend my, uh, I spend my life doing this, <laughs> so <laughs> giving lectures on Zoom, uh, this should work. Um, ah, hang on. I'm going to go back. Now, there we go. Okay, and everybody can see, and that's all good. Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and I'm going to be talking about genetics and human evolution. And Stephen Jay Gould, the American evolutionary biologist, he used to say that every year he taught a course on human evolution. And every year, at the beginning of the academic year at Harvard, he got out his notes and he ripped them up and he started again. Uh, and that was in the 1990s. Now, things are, it's not quite as bad as that. <laughs> We don't have to completely start again, but the discoveries are coming thick and fast. And in particular, as you'll see, the use of genetics, not just looking at bones, but looking at the DNA of extinct people has absolutely transformed our understanding uh, of what happened and how we came to be here. Because that's the big question, isn't it? Where do we come from? Where do humans come from? And for very many years, uh, over a hundred years, it was assumed that there was what was called multi-regional human evolution, that we slowly emerged in populations of apes all over the world, kind of more or less simultaneously. And this was the only explanation that people could find of the fact that we're distributed all over the planet and have been there for a very long time. We now know that's wrong. Uh, and something much more interesting and strange took place. This is where we're from. Africa. We're all from Africa originally. And what I'm going to do is to give you an explanation of how we know this, what that tells us about humans and our distribution, and then we'll discover some quite astonishing things, I think. So we're all Africans. We can take the DNA from everybody on the planet today, and statistical tests show that our DNA all goes back to an African population from around about 70 or 80,000 years ago. We know from uh, paleontological evidence from fossils that modern humans appeared in Africa around 300,000 years ago. Again, it used to be argued that this all took place in the, in the Rift Valley in, in Africa, in Eastern Africa. The most recent fossils we've found are actually from Morocco. So there's beginning to emerge an idea that we slowly emerge throughout the uh, throughout Africa and not just in one particular part of it. So in a way, it's a bit a kind of African version of multi-regionalism. Rather than having us emerging from eight populations all over the world, now it seems to be suggested that there were 
proto-humans living throughout the African continent and then very slowly they turned into something that we would call a modern human. And then we find some very strange fossils because just recently, about a year ago, uh, a fossil human skull from Greece that has been known for some time was redated using, using the latest techniques. And that dates to around about 180 or 200,000 years ago. And there are teeth that have been found in China, which some people claim are about 100,000 years old, and they are clearly modern human teeth. So if those two dates are true, and certainly for the Chinese uh, date, there is some argument, but let's assume they're true. That would suggest, given what I said, that we all, the DNA of modern humans traces us back to around about 70,000 years ago when we all lived in Africa. That suggests that we weren't necessarily the first humans to leave Africa and other people did too. Perhaps they got to Greece, maybe even to China, but what we know from our DNA, from living human DNA, is that if those people did exist, they didn't contribute to our DNA. They died out effectively. So what happened in 70,000 years ago was that some, some people in Africa, not everybody clearly, but the ancestors of everybody apart from modern Africans began to slowly move out of Africa into the rest of the world. They moved up into the Middle East and so on. So it's possible we actually had many of these dispersal events, as a scientist would call them, many movements out of Africa, probably driven by climate change. I, the change in the climate encouraging people to move, not, not huge, great big distances. It's very clear. We've got to be clear that, uh, yeah, only the 70,000 year dispersal led to modern humans. And this wasn't colonization. These are the kind of words that people use often to describe that, you know, or a trek, the great trek or an expedition, as though people knew where they were going, knew that there was something on the other side of the hill. And we don't need that hypothesis at all. It was none of those things. Instead, we simply walked. This map shows you very, very clearly. All you need to do as a group of hunter gatherers, like our ancestors were, is to move very slowly, a kilometer a year, and that will get you all over the world in the space of easily all over the world in about 20 or 30,000 years. And a kilometer a year is not very much. It's not going anywhere. It's just slowly moving, changing your location very slightly. And we can see here, so we, this emergence throughout Africa and then up, these are our, our ancestors, up around about 100,000 years ago into the Middle East. There's clear evidence of human population, uh, human occupation uh, in the Middle East, and then up into uh, up into the Europe, and then slowly through Asia. And then we did two things. We finally went into uh, what's called Sahel, which is the uh, the uh, another word for uh, Australasia. Uh, we moved into there and got there around about 50,000 years ago. And there's a lot of argument about how we populated the Americas. So until very recently, it's been argued that we basically either we walked across the Bering Straits or maybe we got boats and then went down a coastal route uh, from around about 50, 15,000 years uh, ago in Alaska. And then uh, the earliest precisely dated uh, archaeological remains in the Americas are from about 12,000 years ago. But this summer, you may have noticed, there's an astonishing discovery of teenage footprints in fossilized mud in New Mexico from about 20,000 years ago. So either these people, it's not clear these people persisted between these, these gaps between 12,000 and 20,000 years ago. Maybe these people died out. Maybe they didn't leave any ancestors, any descendants. We're not clear how they got there. It's possible that they actually may have gone across the Pacific because we know that we populated the Pacific with, and these were people who were trying to get somewhere, you know, incredibly brave sailors who would navigate across the seas in their dugout canoes, knowing that there was something beyond the horizon. There was land beyond the horizon because the currents were say, bringing driftwood and they could see that there must be something out there because there was wood coming out from somewhere beyond the horizon. So the, 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 uh, the colonizer or the, the expeditions of the people of Oceania 
are quite extraordinary, but I'm not going to talk about them, unfortunately. So you can see from this map that we don't need, apart from to get to distant ocean islands, we don't need great expeditions. We can just walk to places. And that, I think, is absolutely fundamental. We can see this amazingly in our genetics. And I think this is one of my favourite graphs in the whole of biology. Biology in general doesn't do straight lines. <laughs> physics does straight lines. Biology only does straight lines when it's talking about something that's about physics. But in this case, we've got genetics and we've got a lovely straight line which we've drawn onto it. So what this shows is what's called heterozygosity. Just think of it about the amount of genetic variability in various indigenous populations. So they're not looking at people like me who's all mixed up with lots of different groups, but indigenous populations from, or people who've been living a very long time in these various areas. So you can see we've got Africa up here and this along here, we've got the distance, the walking distance from East Africa. And you can see that the African populations have the highest genetic variability. And that's exactly what you would expect because that is our population of origin. So any, or <clears throat> any animal or plant, you generally find, you'll always find, the largest degree of uh, genetic variability in where it originally found, was originally found. And you can understand this very easily because not everybody left Africa, only some part people left Africa. So by definition, the people who left Africa were a subset of, or contained, carried a subset of the genetic variability of the original population. So when those people moved into the Middle East, around about 100,000 years ago, that population had less genetic diversity than the African population. And then a subset of that group moved up into Europe. And by definition, they too had a subset. And the same with the Central Asia. And from Central Asia, they went on to East Asia. And with each of these steps, as we move across the planet, we are reducing variability and we find that the the lowest genetic variability uh we haven't got uh, people the lowest genetic variability you find here are from people from the very southern part of south america because that's uh, pretty much apart from new zealand the last part of the world that we reached so this tells us two things it confirms our status as an animal and as a classic animal that has the highest genetic variability in our ancestral population and proves that we're all Africans. And it's a fantastic graph. But there are other ways of looking at DNA. You can also look at the total genetic variation in a genome. And this uh, paper, this figure from 2011 is still quite extraordinary. What they did was to sequence completely six humans, two from Africa, two from Europe and two from Asia. And they use some complicated uh, population genetics using, you've got to remember, this gives you, each genome gives you th 3 billion data points because you've got 3 billion base pairs in your DNA. So you can compare each of these 3 billion points. So even if you've only got six individuals, that still gives you an amazingly rich set of data. And you can use population genetics, which is some fancy maths, to work out how many individuals produced the variability we now see. And what this suggests is that the, what's called the effective population size, and that means simply the number of breeding individuals, so not counting children and not counting uh, old people, at various points in the past, this is the effective population size <clears throat> uh, in, uh, on a very complicated scale. And what it shows, is that our population was more or less stable size, but then something happened. Around about 70,000 years ago, our human population was about 12,000 people. So that's a small town. And that, those people are scattered all across Africa, from Morocco in the north to the far south of South Africa. Across a whole continent, you've got the population of a small town. Now, clearly they would be grouped together in uh, little bands of a couple of dozen, and they were interbreeding. But even so, it wouldn't have taken much. It wouldn't have taken much at all for that whole population to just crash and die and for us not to be here. 
So if you ever you hear anybody saying that, you know, we're kind of we're destined in some way to dominate the planet, quite the opposite. We were very, very lucky. The cause of this uh, bottleneck, as it's called, this reduction in variability isn't known. Uh, there's been speculation it's linked to the uh, various uh, climatic events, such as a, uh, a volcano that uh, blew up in the East Indies around that time and will have almost certainly altered the planet's atmosphere. Uh, but that seems not to be the case. We're not quite sure what happened to cause this bottleneck. But what we can say is we were very, very lucky to dodge that bullet. If you had a population of animals with only 12,000 individuals scattered across a whole continent, you'd be very, very concerned. Now, this coincidence between the bottleneck and the movement out of Africa by some populations is quite enticing. It does suggest, but doesn't demonstrate, that there may have been changes in climate, perhaps caused by volcanic explosions or other events uh, that led to human, so small group of humans moving out of Africa and beginning uh, their journey across the world. So climate change, just as it does now determine our future, it may well have played a key role uh, in our future back then. Now, what we found when we gradually emerged out of Africa were two things. Well, the world was already full of smart apes. There were loads of very clever apes living around the, the planet, in particular, not in the New World, so not in the Americas, but everywhere else. Uh, there were apes that weren't our ancestors, they were our relatives. And their presence, their fossils, had already led, as I said, people to imagine this multi-regional hypothesis. But we emerged into that world, we walked into it. But there weren't only these smart apes, there were other humans. And I'm not talking about those lineages that got to Greece or to China. I'm talking about completely different people altogether. Talk about, let's talk first about Neanderthals. So this is a, a skull from uh, Neander, and this is one of the original, I think it's the original Neanderthal skull. And Neanderthal just means the Neander Valley. So this was found in Germany in the middle of the 19th century and excited many people, including Darwin, uh, as a proof of humanity's evolution. And if you look at this skull, I want you to look at it and then take your hands and feel your eyebrows because no human living today looks like this. You can see these brow ridges, these amazing brow ridges, um, even more astonishing. You might imagine, okay, well, these are really thick, heavy bits of bone useful for bashing each other. Not at all, these are hollow. So the function, if any, of these brow ridges is completely unknown. Uh, but this was Homo neanderthalensis, which was found, man of the uh, Neanderthal Valley, which was found in the middle of the 19th century. And they lived in Europe and up into Asia from about 500, 400,000 years ago to about 30,000 years ago. And they overlapped with us in various places for up to five, 7,000 years. And these are not our ancestors, okay? They didn't, you know, they're not our direct ancestors. And you can see the difference between their face and ours. This is the skull of a Cro-Magnon human, so basically one of us. And this is a Neanderthal with this much longer face, much deeper muzzly face and these big thick brow, brow ridges. And we share a common ancestor, we think maybe 800,000 years ago in Africa. And the Neanderthals, for reasons we don't know, they left Africa maybe 400,000 years ago. They did the same thing. They gradually moved up. They lived a long time in the Middle East. We can find lots and lots of their evidence of their uh, encampments up here. And right up to where I am in Manchester, they lived up here at the edge of the ice. Uh, the ice cap came down and the Neanderthals were very hardy and could survive in these uh, very cold climates, lived up here in Derbyshire, just down the road from me. There are items made by Neanderthals that we can find in caves. And this is the kind of image, and Neanderthal is often uh, used as uh, a, a way of describing somebody as particularly being brutish and unsophisticated and all the rest of it. Uh, amazingly, we don't <laughs> We don't actually share this view anymore. This is one equally fictitious, but much more likely reconstruction of a Neanderthal. It's one of the Neanderthals who lived in uh, 
the caves in Gibraltar, because the last place we find fossils from is Gibraltar. And Gibraltar, when the Neanderthals lived there at the time of the Ice Age, I, Ice Age it wouldn't have been a, a rock right next to the sea. It would have been a tall mountain overlooking a plain because much of the Mediterranean was, um, was, uh, was land, the sea levels were much lower, and you would have been able to look over a glorious plain with astonishing animals that you could go out and hunt. So this representation of the Neanderthal, I mean, it's gratuitous in that we don't know anything about face paints, but many modern or current uh, indigenous peoples paint their faces and lots of young people have tattoos all over their body, so why not? The ochre, this red colour on his scalp, that is not, we know they used ochre, we don't know they used it to colour their bodies, but again there's no reason to think they didn't. These bird feathers, now they are not gratuitous, they are found, lots and lots of crow feathers are found in the Neanderthal caves and the they're often called the people of the crow because they were interested in them. We don't know why. They weren't eating them. They were using the feathers for something. And similarly, these long fish bones for these rather fancy ear piercings, they've been found in the caves too. And you can put them together. And this makes a completely different image of a brutish, stupid individual. This Tom Bjorklund is a, a paleo artist. He draws extinct landscapes and individuals. And this fantastic drawing he's done of a Neanderthal carrying his daughter uh, on his back. We know they lived in family groups. We found the genomes of 14 Neanderthals from a cave in the Altai Mountains. And they show, for example, a father. We found the bones of a father and a tooth a milk tooth from a girl who will have lost it around about the age of 14. So we know they lived in family groups. Furthermore, it appears that the males tended to stay in their groups and the females may have moved between them, perhaps like happens in many uh, indigenous people today. They used animal hides. So this Neanderthal skull, look at his teeth. They're all worn down. He's been using his front teeth as a third hand. So he's been holding on to part of the, the, the animal hide and he's been then been cutting it, use it with his other hands, holding it and then using the other hand to scrape away. So this again, using it, your mouth as a third hand is a very common technique and it's caused terrible damage to his teeth. They dive for shells. In some of the Neanderthal encampments, we find shells that can only be found quite deep in the water, several meters down. They must have dived down to get them. They made string. This is the earliest string that's ever been made. It was made by Neanderthals about 50,000 years ago. They made jewelry. These jewels used to be, um, these necklaces used to be thought, oh, well, they, they got them from humans. This isn't the case. Uh, these are items that were found in places and times that there were only Neanderthals. We weren't there. And so you can see this has been, these shells have been pierced and they've had ochre, red coloration put on them. Here we've got uh, a tooth necklace. So these are teeth from an animal which have then had holes, tiny little holes bored in them. So to do that, you need to have something, a drill. Now that drill, you can't make it out of metal, Nobody can make metal, but you can make it out of stone or out of another bone. But again, that requires remarkable precision, a really richly developed culture. They made cave art. This was, people kept on saying, yeah, but the Neanderthals, they did all that, but they never made cave art. Well, here in those Gibraltar caves, they have found these marks, which, okay, it's not Lascaux, the great uh, astonishing caves in uh in France from about uh, 20,000 years ago, but it is clearly a, 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 an object that has been created by somebody. And this has been dated to about 65,000 years ago because of the calcite, these rock stone that is on top of it. And these tiny little bits that are on top of the colors, you can extract that, do some complicated chemistry and then date it. 65,000 years ago, these marks were made at least that's when the stuff on top of it was laid down. So they may be older, and that is long before there are any humans in those caves uh, in Gibraltar. They buried their dead. There's been a lot of argument about this. This individual, people have found lots and lots of pollen in this grave. And some people said, oh, well, there must have been a load of, 
don't know, poppy flowers outside the, the place where this person was laid to rest, or maybe they just fell over and died. And uh, the poppy flowers all blew in uh, and the pollen blew in. And that's why there's lots of pollen in there. Simplest explanation is that the Neanderthals buried their dead and flowers were laid uh, around this individual. And this is a fantastic reconstruction. We haven't yet found any Neanderthal clothes, but given their ability to uh, use animal hides, given their ability to make those necklaces, given their ability to make string, there's no reason to say they wouldn't have been wearing clothes because I can tell you it gets pretty nippy up here in Manchester without an ice age. And if you're living in Manchester, going out and hunting stuff, uh, you know, 60 odd thousand years ago, time of the ice age, you would most definitely have needed clothes. So the question then comes, if we put them in modern clothing, what would they look like? Well, this chap here, I've got a few mates who look like this. Um, they would look just like us. So what happened to the Neanderthals? Well, we don't know why they disappeared. This is the last place they would have been, Gibraltar, as I said. Then there would have been no sea. It would have been, well, it would have been much, much lower. Dozens and dozens of kilometers, uh, meters lower, and all this would have been land. We can do the same kind of fancy uh, genetics we did on the humans and work out what was their effective population size, maybe 10,000. So that's not too bad. Uh, but again, if this was an animal, we'd be very worried because that's throughout the whole of Europe and Asia. And they, there's a suggestion people have been trying to understand to model their a lifestyle, maybe they lived in groups of a dozen or so. So you can imagine these people wandering around the landscape, eating food as hunter-gatherers, occasionally meeting up for celebrations or encounters of whatever kind. But these are very, very small populations. But you can see they clearly had culture. But the truth is, of course, they didn't disappear. <laughs> Well, they did in one sense. We don't find any Neanderthal bones after about 30,000 years ago. But in 2010, an extraordinary feat that I think most of us thought was complete science fiction. Uh, a group of uh, researchers uh, based in Germany were able to sequence the Neanderthal genome. So they got bones from very dry, cold conditions, and they were able to extract DNA from those bones that they could then stitch together to show the Neanderthal genome. And what this proved to everybody's astonishment, I mean, first you had the, the extraordinary technical feat of just doing this, but then it revealed immediately when they compared the Neanderthal genome with ours, that non-Africans clearly bred with ne Neanderthals, because people like me have around about three or 4% of our DNA from has come from the Neander Neanderthals. And there's only one way you can get that. <laughs> get that DNA, and that's by mating, let's just put it that way, by mating with the Neanderthals. And so this suggests very strongly that, depending on your definition of species, if you're a biologist like me, you tend to use a biological definition. Species are groups of organisms that, can inter that, that do not interbreed. Clearly we interbred and we had fertile hybrids because you know I'm here now and part of my DNA shows that. So around about 3% of non-African DNA is Neanderthal. There's been a lot of discussion about whether we can see any Neanderthal DNA in African DNA in, from indigenous people in Africa. And I think most people now agree there's a tiny amount. So what will have happened is some of the people who went up into the Middle East, met the Neanderthals, mated with them, produced hybrid offspring. Some of those hybrid offspring went back into Africa and those genes very slowly percolated throughout the African population. The genes we've got uh, from them on the genes that uh, have been significant have been those involved in skin color and in our immune re response in particular. And we think probably the Neanderthals had as varied skin color as modern human populations did. I think the key thing to get over is that there are only, if you compare the Neanderthal DNA with a human, there are 31,389 single base pair changes, which isn't very much. If you consider we got 3 billion base pairs, just 30 odd thousand. So that's whatever is 0.01% or whatever it is, less it, differ, a tiny, tiny fraction. 
And above all, only 96 amino acids. So what you, and you've got your DNA and each three letters of DNA in a gene that is going to produce a, 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 a protein, each three letters produces an amino acid. So there's only 96 amino acid differences between a human and a Neanderthal. So the differences in our proteins and the proteins we produce, because proteins are made of amino acids, were absolutely tiny. There are about 3000 regulatory regions that show differences, however. So that's what the other bits, most of these differences are just in junk DNA that doesn't do anything. But there are differences in around 3000 regulatory regions. So these are parts of your DNA that tell genes where and when to be expressed. And that may have produced the, the morphological differences we can see, those big brows, slightly different form. They would tend to be a bit more stocky than us, a bit shorter, and maybe behavioral differences as well. So what did these matings look like? Well, I think we can say with great confidence, it wasn't like this, um, but maybe it wasn't like this either. Um, it may have been unpleasant, rape and horror, or it may have been just people doing what people do, which we do an awful lot of, which is just having sex with people you bump into and think, we well, look quite nice. Um, yeah, who knows? What we do know is that a European alive today, alive 40,000 years ago, a European human alive 40,000 years ago, had as much Neanderthal DNA as you do from one of your great, great grandparents. So initially there was an awful lot of Neanderthal DNA in our ancestors. And then very slowly, most of it was removed, but there's still enough Neanderthal DNA scattered around the planet. You can reconstruct from living humans about half of the Neanderthal genome. So different lineages, different groups have got different parts of it. Um, in a way they never died. So that's in 2010. And then the year after, something even more extraordinary. And this is you know, one of the bombshell discoveries in science of the last, of this century. In around 2008, this tooth had been discovered in a cave called Denisova Cave in Siberia. And now, you know, if you're, if you're like me, you look at this tooth, you just say, it was a big tooth, it's a big molar. But this thing is huge, it's really, really big. So the people who found it knew it was weird. It's not a human tooth, it's not a Neanderthal tooth. And they were very, very interested by this. Uh, and the cave is called Denisova because, or Denisova, uh, because there used to be a hermit called Saint Denis, allegedly, who lived in there. So that's the name of the cave. And this is the name, the Denisovans or Denisovans, if you prefer, there's no right pronunciation. I say Denisovans. Uh, the Denisovans, this odd tooth seemed to suggest there might be a new kind of human. But don't forget what I said. The earth was covered with weird apes around about 150, 200,000 years ago. So maybe this was just one of those weird apes. It's not our tooth, not a Neanderthal. And then they found a tiny, tiny finger bone, this. And very bravely, they found the bone in the dust and muck in the base of the cave. They decided to destroy it. And the reason they wanted to destroy this bone, which no longer exists, was to get at the DNA, to find out exactly what was this strange life form that they had found. So this is what the, out the mouth of the cave looks like today. It's really quite pretty. It's down here in the mountains in the middle of Siberia. And in 2011, they published the DNA sequence and it was a complete bombshell. They also revealed the existence of the tooth, which they've been keeping quiet because this DNA was completely weird. Nobody imagined this. And this has led to them being called the Denisovans. There is no, unlike the Homo neanderthalensis, there is no Latin name for these individuals. We just call them the Denisovans. Nobody knows exactly what they were because we found that these Denisovans were very, very close to us, a bit like the Neanderthals. Furthermore, modern populations in Asia 
and out into the Pacific all have Denisovan genes. They have Neanderthal genes as well, and they have Denisovan genes. So what this suggests is when our ancestors moved out into further into Asia, up here, up here into Asia, and then down into China, and in fact, as we'll see, down into, a, into the Pacific, they encountered people who were already there and people who, in whatever way, they ended up having sex with and exchanging their genes. So modern people have Denisovan genes. And in one of those astonishing discoveries, only three years before this, we had found out that there was a gene in Tibet, in modern Tibetan people who lived in these high altitudes for a long, long time, they have a very special gene that enables them to live at high altitudes, it increases uh, their, their, their oxygen absorption. That gene came from the Denisovans we now know. So it wasn't only just weird stuff, it was actual genes that you could use that we inherited and somewhere, sometime, around about 50,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, an ancestor of modern human mated with a Denisovan, and that gene was used eventually by uh, the modern Tibetan populations. We know that the Denisovans could use boats. This is amazing because there've been lots of studies of modern indigenous people who live out uh, here in the Pacific. Here we've got Indonesia. And there's something called Wallace's line, which was noticed by Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, who was one of the co-discoverers of the theory of evolution by natural selection with Darwin. And he noticed that on either side of this line, you got different land animals. You got the same birds all over Southeast Asia. But if you looked at the land animals, you got one set of animals here and another set of animals here. And Wallace couldn't really figure out what was going on. We know that this line is in fact the areas of sea that never became dry. So even when the oceans were at their lowest because of the ice, ice pack, ice, ice caps, sorry, there was no, you couldn't walk over here. You could, you had to use a boat. And that's how we got to uh, out into uh, Asia and into Australasia and New Guinea. And we know from looking at the DNA of indigenous peoples who live out here, that they, when they went out there, they met the Denisovans. And there've been probably three encounters with the Denisovans out here in Southeast Asia. It's possible that one of those could have been as recent as 15,000 years ago. I think, I mean, people argue about this because this is, involves interpretation and maths and so on. So there's plenty of room for it to go horribly wrong. Um, but I, th I think that is probably wrong, but maybe not. And that would suggest that in that case, the Denisovans lived on for a very long time. Whatever the case, around about 50,000 years ago, we moved down here uh, across Wallace's line, getting a boat. So the ancestors of the modern Aboriginal peoples, they use boats to get uh, into Australia and the Denisovans would have done so too. We've been able to discover the offspring of a Neanderthal and a Denisovan. This is astonishing. This is the kind of science that can now be done. So uh, this is a, a fragment, tiny little bone fragment that was found in Denisova cave. And these fragments, there are loads and loads of them. And what people did was to scan this using what's called mass, mass, spectro I can't say mass spectrometry, using a particular version of that developed by my colleagues at the University of Manchester. And they were able to notice, basically you put loads and loads of fragments and you zap it with a laser. I'm kind of summarizing it a bit. You zap it with a laser and basically that will pick up the proteins that are on these bones. Because these aren't fossils, remember. These aren't, this isn't rock, this is real human bone. And also there's all sorts of other bones down there in, in the Denisova cave, there are fragments, all sorts of stuff. And if one of the, you're just screening loads of these tiny fragments, because you can't look at that and say anything about it, except, well, it's a bit of bone. Um, and when it came back weird, then they could then grind it up and extract the DNA. And they were able to do that and they demonstrated that these bones, this is about two centimeters long, this tiny bit of bone was the offspring, it had a Neanderthal mother and the Denisovan father. So that is really quite extraordinary. This suggests, the fact that we found this thing relatively frequently, this thing quite easily, uh, suggests that such matings will have taken place quite often. So 
it wasn't just us and the Neanderthals and the Visivans. It wasn't just us who was quite keen on such activities, but the Neanderthals and the Denisovans were as well. The Denisovans apparently, well, what is it? Art? This is a, a mark on a bone from over 100,000 years ago. We don't know what it means, if anything, uh, but it's a link, site link to not modern humans. People who look different, maybe Denisovans, maybe one of those other smart apes. This is a representation again by Tom Bjorkland of a, uh, one of these Denisovans, Denisovan woman living high up in the, in, the, uh, in the mountains, in the Himalayas. And you may remember a year ago, there was big excitement on the internet about animating images. Uh, so I did that, I put that in. There she is, looking back at us, 50, 60,000 years ago. Now, maybe we, one of the striking things is we don't have any Denisovan skulls, or maybe we do. This was found this summer, or rather it was dated finally this summer. This strange skeleton, look at that. And these brows are even bigger than that on a, uh, a Neanderthal. The brain case is about the same size as ours, perhaps a little bit bigger. Um, the face is nice and flat like ours, but those, bro those brow ridges, that's weird. This skull was found in China in a well and has now been dated to around about 100, between, I mean, look at the dates, they're pretty big, 138,000 to 300,000 years old. So this is clearly not a human. We don't know what it is. The people who found it have given it a particular uh, binomial, uh, homo longi. I'm not sure many people are terribly happy about that. It could easily be a Denisovan and, you know, completely gratuitous gr chatter, including from people like me, who I'm not a human paleontologist. I'm I'm convinced this is a Denisovan, but I don't know. We can even, and this is some of the work that I've been doing, and I'm going to finish, start to finish up now. We can even understand how the Neanderthals and the Denisovans smell, their sense of smell. There's one particular odor called androstenone, and we all differ, differ in our ability to smell it. And our ability that means whether we think it's nasty or nice depends on two parts of a particular protein that we have a gene for. And this is a receptor protein that is expressed high up in the, the, the lower part of our, our brain and our nose, uh, our olfactory receptors that dangle down through the base of our skull. And we have proteins on that enable us to smell. And single base pair chains, this changes a C to a T and a T to a C mean that this either smells nasty or nice. So we can go and look at that gene in the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes because they're the same as us. They've got the same olfactory receptor genes and they would have thought it smelled disgusting as well. I think it smells quite nice, but lots of people think it smells absolutely foul. Together with my colleagues in America, we've also now ex expanded this study and looked at a range of these olfactory receptors that have got a very narrow range. We know pretty much how they respond. And we can say that Denisovans, were particularly sensitive to smells associated with honey. So maybe that was an important part of their ecology. Maybe they went and raided beehives and they really liked honey. And the Neanderthals were much more sensitive to sulfurous smells. So maybe they liked the smell of farts or maybe they hated it. We, we can't tell which way it went, but we just know that the proteins that their genes produced were much more sensitive than a modern day humans. But it's not all about DNA. There are also these other bones that we found. This is Homo floresiensis, found on the island of Flores, which is out there, out in Southeast Asia, uh, in one of those islands around near Lor Wallace's, Isle, Wallace's line. And this immediately became called the Hobbit for obvious reasons. This is a modern human. This is the skeleton of Homo floresiensis. We haven't yet got any DNA from uh, the, the Hobbits because they are unlike the Neanderthal remains, they've all been found in humid, warm caves. And there's nothing better for destroying DNA than warm, wet environments in which bacteria can just gobble it up. So for the moment, we haven't found any, but people have been very clever. They've looked at the DNA of people out in Southeast Asia, and we can see the uh, events, these interactions with Denisovans, but there's nothing else weird. There's no big, interaction and no big bit of DNA that looks strange. So this suggests that maybe we didn't mate 
with the uh, Homo floresiensis, but it's not a proof. We'll have to, if we get DNA, then we'll know. And this is the cave out in Flores, huge, great big place uh, where the the uh, hobbits were living. So this is the modern picture because we now know from looking at DNA that although there's no big introgression in Asian populations, modern Asian populations, they did interbreed with other forms, not just uh, the uh, Denisovans, but maybe other forms as well. So you can see the Neanderthals are mating with the Denisovans and vice versa. The Denisovans are mating with us. And there is also unknown contribution. And this is absolutely fascinating that in modern African populations, after my ancestors left, there were still things in Africa. Humans, yes, they must have been because they left DNA. We don't know what they were, uh, were but there is unknown DNA. Afri modern Africans have a unique DNA signature. Something happened after my ancestors left 70,000 years ago to leave an imprint in their DNA. So that means there are unknown fossils out there in Africa. If we can find them, we can predict from this that there must be something out there. Just as when we found the Denisovan DNA, we said, well, there's obviously gonna be something very strange out there. And maybe we found it with that dragon man uh, skull. This is another way of understanding human evolution <laughs> because this way is really, really complicated. And there's a lot we don't know. So. Uh, I think this is this is the thing to cover to remember homo sapiens chimps common ancestors to them and then god it was really complicated we had a good time so what is, what makes us human then in this case well cooperation and how we run our societies and we shared that as we can see with the organization of the uh of the neanderthal societies so we share i mean we were and we and neanderthals are all the same species and denisovans i would argue but we also art, we share with, at least with the Neanderthals and probably with the Denisovans as well. And that art can be symbolic or functional, or maybe it's just art. I'll just show you some examples of our art. This is one of the earliest things that we've, uh, artifacts we've found. And this is an ochre factory in South Africa from a hundred thousand years ago. It's made by humans. And they were grinding out stone using these cowrie shell, these shells. And this meant they could get the red pigment that you could then use to decorate your body. or to make paintings like in Lascaux. The same techniques 75,000 years later are being used in Lascaux. So clearly we're closer to Lascaux than Lascaux was to that ochre factory. Other examples of human art uh, on rocks, in caves, extraordinary examples from France. And this uh, from Spain uh, appears to be a woman climbing up into a tree and raiding a bee's nest and here are the bees buzzing around very cross trying to stop uh, the woman from raiding the beehive but we seem to have taken this with us so this is again quite amazing as soon as we got to Indonesia we got to Indonesia about 40,000 years ago this cave has been found and these handprints which we did everywhere as soon as we went somewhere we are making these handprints ground up ochre blowing it uh, ochre with spittle through onto your hands, leaving your mark, these negative hand marks. They're found all over the planet. People did it. And it's not simply we were here. These things are found in very deep, and these aren't caves we're living in. These are caves we've gone into for some reason. There's some significance that we are given. We can't know what it is, but there's an importance to going into a cave, deep into a cave, and leaving a mark showing and perhaps talking with the people on the other side of the rocks. These drawings found on Stone Age rocks, engravings that you can only see if you put soil, coloured soil into them because they're there or if hold them at a particular light. I mean, these are brilliant doodles. This is you know, this old git. I didn't like him. I'm going to draw him with a big nose. This way, he's a cheeky chappy. But above all, of course, we were making tools and like the Denisovans and the Antitals, making tools and getting very, very good at it. And eventually that tool use and our intelligence enabled us to spread out across the planet to reach the farthest parts of it, something the Neanderthals and the Denisovans were never able to do. And when we got there, whether it's a coincidence or not, 
the megafauna, as they're called, the big animals all disappear. When we get to a part of the world, the big animals go and the mammoths go. And, the, you know, the Neanderthals would have eaten mammoth and have taken them down. But we were so good at it that people out in Siberia made their caves out of the bones of the mammoth. And eventually, whether it was directly caused by us or caused by what's called fragmented populations, changes to the climate, natural changes leading to smaller and smaller populations, eventually the mammoths all disappear. But just remember, the last mammoths ever disappeared at the time that the pyramids were being built because the last mammoths weren't as big as this. They weren't mammoth. They were reduced in size. They had island dwarfism, which often happens. And maybe that explains what happened to the hobbit too. Species that live on islands often get very small. And the last mammoths lived about four and a half thousand years ago on Wrangell Island, which is off the Alaskan coast. But above all, we, as we went and as we multiplied and as we used our intelligence, we wrought havoc on the ecosystem. What we're doing now is an amplification of what we have done throughout our lives. So what are the implications of all this? Well, human uh, evolution is messy and it's complicated and there's no straight line leading to us and we're not inevitable. There was nothing inevitable about our survival, about our getting through that bottleneck uh, 70,000 years ago when there was only 12,000 of us. There was nothing inevitable about that. We were very, very lucky. There are more fossils to be found in Africa and elsewhere. So we know where to look. We're going to find amazing new fossils. There's more DNA to be found because ancient DNA has changed the way we view ourselves and our close relatives, the Neanderthals. And it's even enabled us to discover the Denisovans that nobody had any idea existed. There's no, re you know, no I suggestion that that lineage was there until we could crush up that tiny little finger bone and show that the Denisovans, in fact, it came from a girl who was about nine, sadly died, uh, that Denisovan girl, we know it's a girl from the DNA. We know she was about nine from its size and the size of the hand bone. But it's changed our view. Ancient view has transformed everything. It's one of the most exciting areas of science. I hope I've given you some uh, idea of that. And you've been able to see that some of the things I've talked about have just been found out this year. Others of them just last year. It's all happened really in the last 10 years since uh, the uh, discovery of the Neanderthal genome. And above all, our current, and I would argue temporary success, oops, the word success has gone, <laughs> depended not so much on spreading around the world, but above all on the agricultural revolution, which began around about 10,000 years ago, not only in what's called the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, so modern day Iraq, uh, Iran, Israel, Palestine, and so on, but also occurred simultaneously, more or less, in China or in East Asia, and also in the Americas, humans began to settle, began to develop uh, agriculture, to tame animals and plants. That leads to settled settlements, to the beginning of class society, to lots of new diseases. So if you're interested in medicine, that's also key because you keep people together in little villages, small towns, you start to get lots of interesting new diseases. And once you've done that, you alter the environment around you you change, there's no going back. We can't go back to a hunter-gatherer existence. And that leads eventually to the astonishing and alarming changes we have around us today. So if you wanna know more, Svante Parbo is the man who almost single-handedly pioneered all this because he's the man who had the obsession about this crazy idea of extracting uh, Neanderthal DNA. Uh, Be Becky Regs Rag Sykes has written this very poetic book about Neanderthal life. She's, an anthro she's a paleoanthropologist. And my good friend, Adam Rutherford, the geneticist, has written a brief history of everyone who ever lived, which tells you that story and what came afterwards and how we're all related. And with that, I'm going to finish. You've gone a little bit over time. I hope that hasn't been boring. You haven't, nobody's gone to sleep. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, um, I don't know how we're taking questions. James, yes, you need to take control. Uh, I'm, I'm back here. Hey, well, thanks, thanks, Eric, so much for that, Matthew. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, you really managed to convey the excitement of uh, what's happening in this field uh, at this moment, uh, beautifully delivered as well. So, 
many thanks. Uh, so uh, we're just waiting for people to uh, uh, kindly uh, place their questions in the Q&A that I can pick up and pass on to Matthew. Uh, but Matthew, maybe I could just ask you uh, if you could just describe to us some of the technical challenges that must exist to, to demonstrate that when you find one of these um, uh, bone fragments from a Denisovan or from a Neanderthal, how you prove that that you know, has been contaminated with uh, yeah. DNA from those who've uh, discovered those bones. Oh, right, well, I've got a confession to make. Um, in, I think it's 1996, so science, science labs often have what are called journal clubs. So a new paper comes out, often from it's, a, it's from a rival, a new paper comes out, a scientific paper comes out that you, you work on, uh, an area you work on, you sit around and you discuss it and you rip it apart because you, you're, savvy, you're generally jealous that you didn't do it. In 1996, Svante Perbo, uh, who had previously tried to extract DNA from Egyptian mummies, so whatever that is, 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, he suddenly published this paper in which he claimed he had isolated what's called mitochondrial DNA from uh, a Neanderthal bone. And the mitochondria are tiny little structures we all have in our cells, and uh, they're inherited from mother to child. They're inherited via the maternal line, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a weird kind of DNA that basically the, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. That's what enables us to be multicellular. All, all, all multicellular organisms have them. And he, extra he said, we've extracted mitochondrial DNA from a Neanderthal bone. And we sat around in the lab and we laughed. We said, this is rubbish. This is a contamination. You cannot get DNA from 50,000 years ago. It's all been eaten by bacteria. How wrong we were so uh, but our suspicions were not justified but you know that goes to the heart of your question you have to be incredibly careful uh, so ancient dna labs use very stringent safety protocols everybody's in kind of full uh, gear uh, to protect them from being any contamination they're very very you have to be very very careful you do lots of control experiments to show that what you have is indeed from this particular sample and you're going to drill into it you're not going to get stuff from the outside that's why they had to destroy the poor old Denisovan girl's finger bone uh, because they needed to get at the DNA inside not just from the outside where it would clearly be contaminated but with great difficulty is the answer Mike uh, James. Yeah um, so picking up some of the questions then uh, where does Homo erectus fit into this story please? Uh, well, we don't know. And part of the problem, and that's why the, the figure I showed you with the, the, the blurry bit saying unknown relationships, uh, and that's by Chris Stringer. And Chris Stringer is at the, um, uh, the Natural History Museum in London. And he really knows about this. I mean, this is just, I just teach this stuff. I don't do, apart from the stuff on smell, which is, you know, um, genetics, I don't work on bones. So let's be very clear. I have to bow to uh, the knowledge of, of, of other people. But Homo erectus is going to appear is one of those smart apes that is everywhere. And it, the homo business says that the lumps we can see at shape of its skull and its anatomy suggest that it is part of our lineage, um, whether it's a direct ancestor or a um, it's some kind of cousin. We're not sure. There are people who speculate that some of the weird DNA we can see either from Africa or out in East Asia uh, may be Homo erectus, because there were Homo erectus living out there maybe 150,000 years ago, perhaps more recently. You can tell that from the, the age of the bones. They may have mated with the Denisovans. Yeah, the, so the, we may, it's hard to tell. I think the, 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 the names of these species or these groups, these, these types, is beginning to, people are becoming a bit less confident in them. And the paleontologists like them because they've identified a fossil. I think geneticists are a bit more wary because we can see genes being swapped about and that normally happens within a species. Great, thank you. Um, I think you've alluded to it, but um, do you suspect that there are uh, other lost populations in modern human ancestry? Well, yeah, I mean, there may be other Denisovan kind of you know fossils lurking there which we can then extract dna from which we've no idea from and this might account for some of the uh, odd dna we can see or you might have an earlier dispersal from africa 
who, which lived in Europe and Middle East and Asia for long enough to have become what's called isolated. So they couldn't mate, we, they couldn't exchange genes and they may have not left any trace because as I said, until very recently, we had virtually nothing from the Denisovans except this DNA in them and in us. And that's what made people so convinced it was real. If they just found the tooth, I think there would have just been huge arguments about, well, is it, or, you know, because mm. scientists and with due respect to paleontologists, in particular paleontologists like arguing because partly because they got very little data to go on. They have one tooth, you know, how you fit it in uh, will be hard. So it's quite possible, I think, that there are other such fossils, other parts of our lineage. I think the, the DNA is strongly suggesting that there isn't gonna to be too much very weird. What we don't know is the interrelations between these individuals, these lineages rather, and also what the Denisovans in particular, what they look like. If, it turn, if they can get DNA from either the, the dragon man skull or from some other bone associated with that individual, and that turns out not to be Denisovan, then I think, yeah, it's, that, could, that would be amazing. I, I mean, I think a lot of people are assuming that it is, but it may not be. Uh, we don't know. So yes, it, it's possible. There are many, there may be other lost populations uh, that have contributed to our uh, existence or that we can see our, our close relatives and they may have left Africa, you know, 800,000 years ago, whatever. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, a question that came in earlier this evening, when humans began to travel and evolve uh, or adapt, did mutations cause the change in skin color or did they all um, have differences? In we, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, the best words in science. These are the key words in science. We do not know. And they're exciting because one that shows, hey, we don't know everything, but also, Implicit in those words is a challenge. How could you find out? So uh, the part of the problem is that human skin color is very complicated in genetic terms. There are over 15 genes, major genes involved in it. So each gene is gonna have a small effect. And you can see that if you get a black person and a white person, you get an intermediate, the child's skin color, is, is intermediate is intermediate between their, their parents. So that suggests there are lots of genes, each with a small effect. We know from modern African populations, you simply look at people from Africa, they have all sorts of different colored skins. Some people really have quite, not quite as light as me, but pretty light colored skin. Other people have really, really dark colored skins. And in general, we think this is to do with uh, the adaptation to do with, if you have dark color skin, then it protects you against uh, the damaging effects of the sun's rays, fairly obviously. Um, on the other hand, if you end up living in northern climes like Manchester, where it's a bit, the sun is pretty pathetic, you're unlikely to get skin cancer. But you then have a problem with if you're dark anyway, if you're dark, you can't absorb the sun's rays as well. And you need that to create vitamin D. The only place we can get vitamin D is from the sun. So if you then move up into northern climes, you need to, you generate, people generally have lighter skin color. You can just, this is kind of trivial observation. And we think that those two things went hand in hand, but not necessarily straight away and in an absolute way. You may have seen a reconstruction of Cheddar Man, which is a, a human, modern day human who would have lived in uh, the Cheddar Gorge uh, from about 8,000 years ago. And people got very cross because this reconstruction had dark skin, but there's no reason to think he wouldn't have done. Uh, it's not a completely tight link between skin color and living in the northern climes. And you can see, for example, um, uh, Inuit people have quite dark colored skin, much lighter, much darker than me anyway. And they're living in places where the sun's even even worse. You know, they get even less vitamin D from uh, the sun's rays because they're living uh, in you know, in quasi, quasi darkness part of the year round. So skin color is, is very complicated. It would have been a mixture of favored groups. Maybe the people who had lighter skin survived longer and so left more offspring. And that's why you end up with it as they, you move north or it may have been a series of mutations. But you can clearly see this distribution now 
in modern human populations in skin color. It's kind of kind of obvious, but the genetic basis of it is complicated. Right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so um, you've mentioned the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. You've not perhaps mentioned some of the older civilizations on Earth, uh, the Mahenyo, Daro, um, Raki, Gari, Haryana in India, that are apparently even older. Uh, any comments on that, Matthew? I'm not sure if you can see that uh, question. Well, yeah, um, I don't, I, I, I would dispute those, those dates. I think that, I mean, part of the problem is finding accurate dating of objects. And in particular, if you find them in layers of mud or soil, it's very difficult to be confident where they are from. And uh, I don't think there's any evidence that there was any settled human uh, existence more beyond 10 odd thousand years ago, anywhere in the world. Now, the, um, to give you an example of how difficult it is, people get very, Denisova cave has been lived in by us, by Neanderthals and by Denisovans. So we know we find their bone, our bones in the, in, the, in the soil. We also find extraordinary objects. And if you type in a Denisovan bracelet, for example, you will find an image of an extraordinary object. And this is a, a, a jade bracelet. So jade's that, that lovely uh, green uh, stone that is kind of translucent. And this is a half bracelet. And the people who are, the Russian scientists who are working out there claim that this is a Denisovan object because it's found in the right layer of the cave. But there's no actual date associated with it. The dating of the layers is very hard and is disputed. And many uh, archeologists say, and paleontologists say, well, it'd be very nice if it was, and, and maybe it is but it's more likely that it's from much more recent, a Bronze Age artifact made by a human. On the other hand, let's just remember that there's been a lot of kind of humanocentric views. <laughs> remember what we thought about the Neanderthals. Um, I think the only issue is that there is nothing like this anywhere else ever been found apart from in kind of Bronze Age cultures. So if it were a Denisovan object, then that would be absolutely mind boggling. And they would have had a cultural advance on everybody else anywhere in the planet of about, you know, 25,000 years more, 45,000 years. So part of the issue is the dating of these places. And there's also, it, it's, you've got to be very careful because many peoples around the world have their own stories about how they got there. Indigenous peoples have their stories about how they got there. And India is a place where there is a lot of argument where, archaeology, genealogy, and modern day politics mix up. And in particular, this has been a huge issue in North America. So we have indigenous DNA from peoples all over the world, but we have very little from the North American peoples because they are very suspicious of what these predominantly white scientists want to do with that DNA. Mm. And their stories about how long they have been there um, for example, when the, the footprints, the teenager footprints were discovered in New Mexico this summer, loads of North American indigenous, indigenous people said, yeah, well, we knew that. We knew we've always been here. Now, I think most scientists would say, well, you probably haven't always been there because you got there. It may have been longer than we originally thought, but you haven't always been there. But it, 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 these are clearly very, very sensitive issues and they mix up with politics and science has had a very poor record of dealing with artifacts or even worse, human remains of people who have descendants or who doesn't really matter whether they do or they don't, who uh, modern people think, believe that they are their descendants. Uh, they are their ancestors and for whom therefore these objects have incredible significance. They may not have known they were there, they've been dug up by scientists or archaeologists and then that takes on a, a political significance and I think scientists of all kinds have a an important duty, one, to say tell the truth but uh, also of course to be extremely sensitive about 
the views of the indigenous people whose territory they may be digging up, whose ancestors they may be digging up, or even worse, whose ancestors they may have sitting in a museum. Uh, Manchester Museum, my, the University of Museum here, has had a, an excellent record of repatriating uh, Aboriginal and Maori remains uh, that were extremely important. And, you know, in some cases, these were, we've had people over who've said, well, this is my great, great, great grandfather. You know, can I have him back? And we've said, yes, of course. And we've had very moving ceremonies. So uh, to get to back to the question, I, you know, I think you need to, we need to be critical, but we also need to recognize both sensitive, but also recognize that sometimes these arguments are primarily driven by modern day politics. That was a bit long, sorry, but. but Matthew, I am conscious of time and- um, Well, I'm, I'm fine, I can I, carry on. I mean, I'm going to the else going, it's up to I, you. I, to, I just maybe like to select out one more question for okay, you. Okay, I'm sorry for the rest of you, I've gone on too long. No, not at all. Um, what do you think are the most likely next developments in human, uh, human evolution? <laughs> well, if I knew that, I'd be planning next year's lecture already. I have no idea. Um, I guess that we will eventually either identify the uh, dragon man as being a Denisovan, or we will find more Denisovan skull. They found a bit of a jawbone in uh, Tibet, and that is almost certainly a Denisovan. And so we'll end up with a, a skull. But that, that, that portrait I showed you of the Denisovan, that's based on some astonishing work. They looked at the genome of it, because we don't have a skull that we can confidently identify. They looked at the genome of the Denisovan, Adenison. They looked at the what are called the regulatory regions, those bits that are amplifying DNA and changing how it's expressed, in particular in parts of the genome that are involved in the face. And they did some very, they looked at modern day humans, they did some very fancy genetics, and then they suggested the kind of image that it would look like. And that's on the basis of that, that Tom Bjorkland made that prediction. So that's a prediction of what the skull would look like. And it's not that different to the dragon man skull, but who knows? Uh, so I think there's both some fancy genetics is gonna give us some insight and we're gonna find some more fossils, which with luck we'll be able to uh, use to extract DNA. And then you've got a really tight link between the fossil and maybe the object that it's associated with. So tools or perhaps jade bracelets, but I doubt it. Uh, seriously, go and look at that jade bracelet. It is amazing. Whoever made it. Wow, watch this space. Uh, Matthew, uh, would you be perhaps kind enough to post some answers to some of these questions? On our yeah, way? of course, of course. Uh, I need to... Um, I'll uh, make, a, make a, a note of um, questions that we haven't been able to get to this evening. Um, I'd like to call upon my colleague, uh, Karen Edwards, now to perhaps um, come in and um, uh, capture some feedback for this evening. Uh, so... Um, Many thanks to those who are regular attendees, but also a huge welcome to those who have perhaps uh, not uh, attended this series before. Over to you, uh, Karen. Great, thanks. Uh, just wanted to add my thanks to Matthew. Really fascinating talk, really uh, exciting stuff. Um, so hopefully our audience has enjoyed tonight. And I just wonder if those of you who are still with us, I, there's quite a lot of you, I know, which is great. Would you mind just giving us some quick feedback? So I'm just going to... Um, share my screen with you now. Um, okay. Oops. Oh, sorry. Bear with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So can you see, um, Mike, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see my Menti presentation? No, it's, it's, it's not coming through clearly, Cass. It's just like a, a strip down the middle of the... Oh, no. The, the screen. You just um, um, stop sharing and try again. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, that's great, Karen. Great. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, okay. If I can ask you, if you've got a, a maybe a phone um, with you, if you could uh, navigate on your uh, browser to menti.com, 
and the code that you need to put in is there at the top of the screen <laughs> looks like some of you've got there already thank you and um, those of you that have been to our lectures before will uh, recognize the uh, format here so it'd be really great if you could uh, just let us know where you're joining from today uh, i'll just give a minute for people to catch up on uh, the vote in there Okay. Great. Okay. Quite a few uh, Welsh folks then by the looks. I know we did have a couple from New Zealand, so. Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next question while uh, people are catching up there. So have you attended a lecture before? Uh... Okay, just looking at the voting, looks like uh, quite a, a few new attendees this evening, which is good to see. Hope, hope you've enjoyed. Hope you'll come back for more lectures. Okay. So next question, where did you find out about this evening's lecture? Okay. A lot of recommendations from teachers and colleagues. Okay, it's good to see that People have seen it through other uh, our web page and university events. Great. Okay. Thank you. So what were the top two reasons why you attended the lecture this evening? Okay, to be informed and to be inspired and hopefully you have been. That's great. You. Okay. That's good to see that most people feel their knowledge has, uh, has improved and quite a few would like to find out more about the subject. Great. Thank you. And then finally, describe this evening's lecture in three words. Okay, got some great words there. Fascinating, interesting, informative, helpful, enthralling. Great, dynamic, energetic, certainly was. Fantastic, great. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, taking part and just giving us that feedback. It's really, uh, it's really good to hear from you. Um, if I can, I've, I have popped into, I've answered a few questions already in the chat. So if there are still people here, um, I'm actually, or if you can save the chat, Mike or James, uh, then I've, I've, I've already answered some of the easier uh, questions. So that fantastic. people here, they can go and see. They might fantastic, be happy. Fantastic, Matthew. And uh, if we send them on to you, then perhaps you could uh, post the remaining. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. If you, you mail them to me, I'll, I'll reply. Yeah, of course. Fantastic. Well, Matthew, the word cloud, I'm not sure if you saw it, um, captured uh, everything uh, everyone's felt about this evening's talk. Informative, informative, fascinating, inspiring, exciting. So it says it all, really. And so many thanks once again for giving us your time this evening and you're very welcome and i hope the the younger members i mean i hope everybody's been informed but i hope the younger members some of them may have been inspired to think mm, maybe i could do that and you could you know you go to university study genetics and you can do this absolutely i just like to remind everyone that we're back again on the 11th of november for those of you not aware this year marks the centenary of the discovery of uh, insulin and we're very fortunate we have uh, professor susan wong and Dr. James Pearson, who are going to be uh, celebrating the centenary of insulin's discovery, uh, where next? So that's Thursday, 11th of November. Uh, thanks to everyone. And uh, thanks again, uh, Matthew. Good night now. No start. <laughs>